Uh, what do you make of what the markets did this week? I mean, inflation looks like it's here to stay, it appears right now. It does. And, and I think the markets actually were fairly well behaved against the backdrop of rising interest rates, rising nominal yields. Um, I think, you know, this is a year where the discount rate for equities has demonstrably increased, and we've seen that play through to stocks. The risk of equities right now, and especially the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, are that these are very long-duration benchmarks. There's a lot of growth promised way out in the future for these benchmarks, and we think that that's going to be a um, continued challenge if we see those discount rates rise, as we've seen so far this year. So, so now when we talk about challenges, I should say fixed income has a few challenges of its own. It looks like the Fed is going to have to be raking, rate hiking for some time to come. What do you make of what's going on in the bond market? So, you know, I just say that we have gone up almost 40 basis points in about 10 days <laughs> on U.S. 10 years. This is the deepest, most liquid market in the world. And I'm just looking at this and this level of volatility. It can't be anything that any central bank would welcome. I do think that, uh, unfortunately, we are going to see more of the same, and it's not going to be a nice, smooth grind upwards. We're going to see volatility, but inevitably, the Fed is actually going to need to do more. I think that in the last, uh, after the last Fed meeting, what uh, Fed Chair Powell delivered was a dovish hike. I think what we're going to need to see next week is a hawkish hike. So a promise to follow that the Fed is going to do everything it needs to do with, with, without it being limited to a couple of more months of 50 basis point hikes, for example. So, so now I'm not going to ask you to guess at what the Fed will do next week and going forward. But if you were advising the Fed, would you say it's a matter of when you raise rates or how much you raise them? That is to say, is this a matter of let's get there faster, but the ultimate number we're getting to is not that much higher? Or do these numbers suggest actually you're going to end up higher, so now? I think you might need to get higher. That's, that's the reality. Because, you know, I did see uh, uh, some, something which has baffled me about the Fed dot plots from March, and that's actually almost as interesting as the actual meeting next week, is that the Fed essentially had inflation coming down almost by itself. <laughs> there was, uh, in the sense that you had massively negative rates, even as inflation was collapsing in those dot plots. I don't think that's realistic, not in the least. Therefore, I will be looking for some added layer of sober realism in what the Fed shows us next week. And uh, to, to your question, is it how much or is it when? I think it's actually both. It's probably yeah. going to need to be higher rates and they need to be we need to get there faster. It's smarter to get there faster because, let's put it this way, we've had a full year of inflation being above 7%. We've had two years of inflation being actually above 6%. Right. So when do expectations start catching up with this? You know, I think that that's a great point. And, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is that the multiple on the market is still really out of whack with where inflation is right now. Yeah. So when you think about the relationship between the P.E. ratio of the S&P and inflation rates, usually when inflation rises, P.E. ratios come down. Granted, we've seen the, the multiple come down with the, the sell off in the market, but we're still at a fairly high and elevated levels level of valuation for where we are on an inflationary basis. So I think, you know, when we look at the data, there are some pockets that suggest we're seeing an alleviation in uh, the pricing pressure. So, for example, we look at our credit card data at Bank of America and we found that the shift in spending has moved from mm -hmm. big ticket items to uh, services. So at some level, one could argue that that may serve as some, um, you know, moderation in the inflation of raw materials that are used for goods like metals, um, lumber, cotton, etc. But I think the, the, the demand for energy and for oil from flying and hotels and, and all of the activities that we have pent up demand for is going through the roof and energy is going to continue to be a point of pain for, uh, for investors and consumers. So now what about so it? Are we to... seeing some peak inflation in some pockets? So, you know, I, I do agree with Savita to some point, in, 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 to some extent. I'd say that, yeah, we, we also see pockets where we've probably peaked. But I think we're also seeing a little bit of broadening out, actually, because 
to some extent, we are seeing the impact of the fact that people still have reserves from two different sources. One is the savings, which come, which came in the post-COVID period. People do, they have banked a certain amount of savings. Those savings will get used, no doubt, quicker now than we would have anticipated at the end of last year, prior to the energy shock. But we still think that we've probably got enough by way of savings to take us through probably uh, the better part of the first quarter of next year. But uh, even above that, even above the issue of just uh, savings, people are actually going out and using those savings and consumers are entering this phase of the cycle with some of the healthiest balance sheets that we have seen consumers have. They are in a position to actually rack up credit card debt. And historically, the US consumer has done that. It might be a first in the post-GFC period, but I wouldn't be surprised if we started seeing that debt rack up. So now, is anything going to stop this runaway inflation short of a recession? I, you know, so one thing I would note, I don't think it's runaway inflation. <laughs> so I should just note that I think that it's more like pretty high inflation and way too high to be comfortable for the Fed. And I don't know whether you're going to get an outright recession, but I think you are going to need a significant cooling off of the labor market. And the problem is timing. I don't think it's going to cool off quickly enough to prevent us from having quite a lot of inflation first. So, Sonal, I'm just curious your views because, you know, I, I remember before the pandemic, we were all talking about disruption and demographics and all these sources of disinflationary pressure that were long-term secular forces. Mm -hmm. Some of those are still in play. So, you know, I think that there could be some kind of natural suppressants, as you say, maybe this isn't runaway inflation because we still have some, you know, kind of ceilings or, or pressures on, on inflationary mm -hmm. um, forces from just that, those themes that have been in place for, for, you know, the last decade or so. What do you think? So, so actually, you know, we've always talked about demographics as always playing in one direction. And I think that's off the back of Japan. And every case is a special case, right? <laughs> yeah. But if I look at China, there's been some very decent academic work, which actually has said that demographics are going to play in the opposite direction in the case of China. Sure. Separately, I would say that there are new trends which have come out almost as a result of COVID, one of which is uh, insourcing or local sourcing. Yeah, absolutely. And we've got to remember, the reason people outsourced in the first place was to reduce costs. You bring that back closer to shore, it's going to raise, co raise costs. And we haven't even started talking about issues like greenflation, which I think is a real thing. No, Almost I think... Almost separate from... And so I think there are new secular forces, Savita, yeah. which actually add to those original ones. So I right. am uncomfortable today with the entire idea that we have, uh, you know, some kind of a long-term destiny towards low, low rates and deflation. I just don't think it's there.